So to bring a close to today's discussion in terms of the various panels, uh, what we thought we'd do is be able to have a discussion about architecture, uh, grid architecture, and, and, and really kind of bring back uh, to kind of a, a starting point uh, and help to sort of coalesce the various ideas that we've heard about, some of which we're touching on architectural considerations throughout the day, but a way to sort of bring it back to uh, sort of a holistic view uh, and, and help us think about how we would approach uh, the, uh, uh, the start of thinking about modernization, uh, as we heard from the outset, uh, thinking about this from an integrated grid perspective, thinking about it holistic. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to have uh, two thought leaders here in the industry around these topics. First, uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Taft out of the Pacific Northwest National Lab, who, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, by Joe Palladino has done a significant amount of work for the Department of Energy on grid architecture, uh, and Jeff will be sharing his thoughts. And then Mark McGranigan, who you heard earlier, uh, who's been really at the forefront at EPRI, uh, both in the U.S. but also internationally, uh, thinking about the integrated grid and the implications for uh, architectural approaches, uh, both from the physical uh, and the uh, and, and the sort of cyber and information systems, as is as is Jeff. So. Uh, with, no, with no further comment, let me turn it over to Jeff. All right, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about uh, something that we specifically call grid architecture. And um, because the word architecture is used a lot in a variety of contexts, sometimes well, sometimes not so much, I'm going to say a few words about what that is and then about uh, some things about how we use it. So we defined this term for the Department of Energy in, in 2014, and it's based on work that some of us were doing actually long before that, starting with the discipline known as system architecture. And if, for those of you who have been around the utility world for a long time, um, in, in the days of smart grid, you would have heard a lot about uh, architecture, and primarily that would have meant enterprise IT type architecture, uh, especially as applied to the idea of combining IT and OT. But we start from the discipline of system architecture, and in that discipline, um, the, an architecture is an abstract depiction of a complex system, and its purpose is to help us reason about that system, understand its properties, understand um, the relationships among the various pieces, and it really has three parts to it. It has components, but we think of those as black boxes. So, for example, when I'm doing this type of work, if I need to think about st uh, storage, doesn't matter to me whether it's lithium ion or sodium sulfur or anything else. I think about what does it look like from the outside? How much energy can it store? How fast can it go in and out? What's round trip efficiency? How many cycles? But I don't worry about what's inside because that's up to the designers and is not the goal of architecture at this level to specify exactly how those things are supposed to work. An architecture should allow many possible implementations and set the overall shape of the system a design is what specifies exactly and only one implementation, so we're not doing designs here. So we have these kind of black box components. We have structure, the way that things are connected or related to each other. And in this work, we focus a lot on structure. Um, and the reason for that is that it's structure that sets the essential bounds and limits on what a system can and cannot do. Real quick, simple example that you mostly be familiar with. If you have simple radial circuits in your distribution system, and you ask the question, so what can I do by way of self-healing and dealing with faults? The answer is not too much. If, however, I change that structure to allow some partial meshing, allow some interconnections between feeders, then all of a sudden I have lots of possibilities, and you start to see things like what you heard from the S&C folks. It is that structural change that makes that possible, and without that structural change, you can't do those things, and that's what I mean by structure sets the essential bounds. It is the shape of the system, and we focus a lot on that. In a lot of the traditional smart grid architecture work, you'd see a lot of focus on components, maybe 80% components, 20% structure. In our work, it's just about the reverse, about 80% structure, 20% components. And then lastly, externally visible properties. I mean, what does it look like from the outside? What does it do? So we use that to support reasoning about the system, um, and that helps us predict its properties. And a lot of times in the past, we've seen people create architectures in an ad hoc way um, and not be able to predict very well what the system was going to be capable of or do. In fact, you even hear some people talk about emergent properties, like, well, let's put all this stuff together and see what it does. Um, in the utility world, that's maybe not the happiest way to go out doing things. 
We'd like to know what it's going to do and be able to count on what it's doing. So we don't think about that too much. Um, and we can use this to help us identify various gaps, too. So you can use it to say, okay, well, you know what? Uh, my architecture says I need a box here that does thus and so. Is there such a box or not? In fact, when I teach architecture, I tell people be careful of specifying magic boxes. You know, deep inside there, there's a thing that says, in here a miracle occurs. You gotta be careful about that kind of stuff. Sometimes we have to do some investigation to make sure that that thing is gonna be possible. So we wanna be careful about that. So next slide, please. So uh, when we do this is applied to the grid, we take the discipline of system architecture, we add to it some things like um, uh, theory of networks and so on, some things from control engineering, apply it to the grid. And what we do with it is largely help support the grid modernization process because one of the big problems is complexity. And you hear this a lot from the people who are grappling with how do we put all these pieces together. Um, and, and the architect is really more a specialist in managing complexity than anything else. It helps if they know a lot about the, the problem domain, but we have um, subject matter experts for that. So we help manage that complexity and figure out how all the pieces to go together, hence the focus on structure that I talked about. Um, and assist communication. If you think about all the different kinds of stakeholders that are involved in grid modernization, the utility folks, the regulators, um, the consumers, the consumer advocates, on and on and on, they have very different backgrounds, and yet they're all trying to look at this complex thing called the grid, see it from their point of view, see their interests reflected, see the problems, and talk to each other about it. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And one of the things that we do with the grid architecture work is help that kind of conversation go on. Um, we do a lot, however, to think about reshaping the grid. And as you know, we've inherited a grid from the 20th century. That grid has structure, therefore it has constraints built into it. The, the uh, engineers who did all that work did a magnificent job of making it do all the things they should do. And I have enormous respect for the folks who do this in the utilities. But then we came along and changed the rules on them, didn't we? We said, you know what? We want to be different now. We used to have centralized generation that was dispatchable. Okay, let's have some of that, but let's have this other stuff that's stochastic in nature. Maybe we'll connect it at the distribution level and just arbitrarily change the structure on you. So that kind of stuff um, is a problem. And so we have to think about, so what are the essential constraints that we have that arise from the 20th century grid that are structural? What are the minimal structural changes we need to make to relieve those constraints to make it possible or at least easier to do the things we want to do. So when I talk about reshaping the grid, it's not saying, well, we're not a greenfield situation here. We're not a frontier country. We can't just take a blank sheet of paper. We have to work with what we have and make the changes that are necessary to make it possible. When you get the structure right, and this is what's really important about this, when you get that shape right, it vastly simplifies all the downstream decisions that you have to make to put things together. If you get the structure wrong, it becomes very, very difficult to make all those things work together and you find a lot of extra cost and effort in working around those constraints that you may have inherited. So this helps you think about the grid and think about it early on before you have to spend a lot of money. It's kind of important. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I have to tell you a little story that's actually true. My father, when I was young, built a house with his brothers. They actually did it themselves. And um, then later on, he added on a garage to the house. So. Um, one day he actually said to me, and I was pretty young at the time, he said, if you're going to do something like this, what do you think you pick up first, a shovel or a pencil? So he's trying to teach me a lesson here. And when you put it in those terms, it seems real obvious, doesn't it? Then he said to me, I know some guys that try to hang the windows first. And he's trying to tell me not to do that. There's a lot of the tendency to think that way when we talk about grid modernization. You know, the window hangers show up and say, I've got the best window in the world. Let's start putting these up everywhere. Um, and that's a problem because you really need to think about what are your objectives and what should the structure of all this be before you figure out, before you even know where the windows go, right? So this is kind of a little simple object lesson. It's the same thing that applies here. And we, in a very sophisticated way, do that with grid architecture. We think about, you know, let's pick up the pencil first and figure out what the structure looks like and then decide, you know, where we're going to dig and then when are we going to put up the windows and all that kind of stuff. Next slide, please. So we think about the grid in a way that's a little bit different than you traditionally may have heard about. We think about it as a collection of structures. In fact, we actually call this paradigm the network of structures model for the grid. There are different kinds of, of 
structures involved. The electric circuit structure is an obvious one, but we also think about industry structure because we have to think about the various entities that may be involved in the whole operation of the grid. We think about regulatory structure, and by that I don't mean regulatory rules. I mean um, what is regulated by whom and what entities are involved. Um, the digital superstructure is all the ICT stuff that you think about. That's traditionally the domain of like the enterprise IT architecture work is in there. But we think about that. We think about control as a structure. We don't think of control as an application. We think of that as a structure because you heard already today some discussions about should it be centralized, should it be fully distributed, should it be hierarchical, should it be hybrid. That is a structural issue and it's of great concern to us. We think about convergence of other kinds of networks. That would be things like the gas networks for generation, transportation networks, even social networks and how they apply. And then lastly, the thing that we identified that when I first started talking about this several years ago, I got a lot of wrinkled looks on people's faces, coordination framework. How many times did you hear coordination today? You know why? Because it became really obvious with the rise of distributed energy resources that were things that were not owned by the utility, that it wasn't going to be a command and control situation, and so that things had to be coordinated to work together to make all this happen. So there's actually in every system, every power system, there is a thing that we call coordination framework. It may be hard to identify. Some places it's obvious and explicit. Other places it's kind of buried inside something else. And there are some places where it's missing. When we started to understand that, we started to think about that coordination framework and making that concept explicit. So when we talk about coordination, we, we actually look at all of these other structures and say, what is the coordination framework that underlies that, and does it have problems that need to be addressed so that we can go forward with all this stuff? Next slide, please. So when we think about those, those classes of structures, and when we do this work, in an actual case, we use the real structures involved here. We're showing some symbolic stuff here. We think about how those are organized, how those structures relate to each other, and think of it as being like a big tapestry. You know, uh, uh, in the course of the uh, New York Rev work, I built an industry structure model for, for New York, um, which is an interesting case. They're kind of special in some ways. It's a multi-layer model. When I, I didn't bring it here, but when I show it, it's you think you've seen some eye charts today, let me tell you, that's amateur stuff. The eye chart for that thing is just enormously complex. It's like a tapestry. You tug on the thread someplace to make a change, it's going to bunch up somewhere else. You really would like to know about that before it happens, right? Because that can be unintended consequences. And it can happen at any one of those layers. So we think about those layers and how they're related. And we think about maybe sometimes how to regroup them. And this is important because we're going to talk again about platforms. We actually have formalized ways to think about, so what should be a platform? How do we define the platform? What goes in it? What doesn't go in it? In this case, what you see here, we took part of this, the communications networking stuff, and we split it into two pieces. And the communications guys do this all the time, but nobody talked about it today. The upper piece is the logical view of the communications. It's like, where do the data flows want to go to? Where are the applications? Where are the devices? The lower level piece is the physical network they don't always look the same. One maps onto the other, but you don't see the same topology in them necessarily. By separating those layers and regrouping them, and what we did with this is we regrouped the physical network with the electric network, we can use that to help define a kind of platform that you don't usually see. A lot of the platforms you heard about today were software platforms, and that's a very common paradigm in the software world to define platforms. Platform is essentially a structural concept but you can do it with heterogeneous networks. And in here, uh, we did that with a physical communications network, the sensors and control devices, and the electric grid, and treat that as a combined platform layer. Next slide, please. And then what we did was we said, okay, if you look at the way things have been done a lot of times in distribution, you would have variety, different kinds of sensors and communications tied to applications. So you might see an AMI system with its own AMI applications, but also a communication network and the meters. You might see um, a SCADA system and maybe a distribution management system on top of that with some line sensors and whatnot, and maybe uh, going forward uh, a, a, distribute, a, a DER MS, right? So um, when it turned out that one of those applications wanted data that came from the sensors that belonged to another system, 
what do we end up doing? We ended up doing back-end integration, right? So we had to define all this interoperability stuff and do all this integration, and it was really expensive. Any of you have lived through that, you know, we've seen cases where the integration cost way more than the base systems did. And oh, by the way, then in that case, if you change one of those systems, it's likely that the changes are going to end up impacting and rippling through the rest of the stuff. So this is not a very flexible arrangement. And it didn't matter too much in terms of latency originally because at the distribution level we didn't have stuff that required low latency except for protection, um, which wasn't involved in this. Now as we see more and more issues around needing short latency, all of a sudden going back through that back-end integration stuff, not such a good idea. Um, so what we do is take these vertical silos and let's do a structural transformation. Um, let's take those silos and break them up and recut some of this stuff and make it into layers and see if we can use the concept on the previous slide to help us with this. The next slide, please. So when we do that, we've taken the communications, we've taken the sensing and measurement devices, the control devices, made them an infrastructure layer with the electric system, and now we can actually have our applications be decoupled from each other. We can have any ac application that's authorized access that infrastructure layer and be able to receive the necessary data. We can have sensors serve multiple applications simultaneously and independently. This is completely compatible with some of the things you heard from some of the networking folks today and with the open field message bus concept. It's also compatible with the things you heard Joe Palladino talking about in terms of um, laminar uh, uh, coordination uh, frameworks as well. So we, what do we do? We made a structural change. We took silos, we broke them up, we took some of that stuff and recut it and made layers out of it, turned that into a cyber-physical platform of heterogeneous networks, communications and electric circuits. Made that into a platform as opposed to the typical software platforms, and we're able to then decouple a lot of that stuff that was causing us problems. So if we want to add a new application, we don't have to worry about integration with the other applications on the back end anymore. We don't have to worry about the fact that sensors uh, used to belong to an application. Now they don't belong to anything. They belong to this infrastructure layer. And it's very easy, actually, to have sensors serve multiple applications simultaneously. You can actually use a communication network um, to do what Sharon was talking about in terms of uh, pub-sub operations. And we've actually demonstrated how easy that is to do. It also gives you a lot of future proofing uh, in terms of changes both at the communication level and at the application level. So that structural change simplifies a whole lot of downstream issues. And that's the kind of thing that we try to do with grid architecture to make it very practical. So sometimes the way we do it seems a little bit obscure, but we actually can teach that. And one of the things that we're doing with Sharon and SEPA is preparing training programs to show people how to actually get these kinds of conclusions. So it's not just, hey, Jeff did some magic stuff and he showed us something that looks kind of good. We're going to teach people how to do that themselves so they can adapt these things. And the methodology is not really very hard to do this. They're just not the typical kind of thing you do. Next slide, please. So um, we're going to see reshaping of the grid. There are a variety of reasons why that's happening. Um, and not only is the grid going to be reshaped in various ways, we're going to see convergence of various kinds of networks with the grid, you know, the natural gas systems and the transportation systems and so on. And that means the economics of the grids are going to change from the old sort of central economy of scale to more of a network economy. And, and Paul has actually written a lot of stuff about this. In fact, some of this I learned from him. Uh, in terms of the value of the grid itself and what that means uh, in, in going forward, if we have fundamental changes in the way people use the electric system, then there's always this question of, so what? why do we have a grid at all? Uh, why don't we just have everybody having something that's really completely autonomous. Well, there are good reasons for it, but it changes the nature of the way the grid gets operated. And if it becomes itself a platform, there's that magic word again, then that has implications for how it would be structured in terms of control systems, in terms of protection, in terms of communications, in terms of cybersecurity. You also need to think about the roles and responsibilities of various entities involved. Remember I talked to you about industry structure a little while ago? If you are going to give some of, the re, uh, some of the capability for managing the grid to third parties, and yet the distribution utility has the responsibility for reliability, you have to think about what are the responsibilities that go to those third parties too. Do they have responsibility for cybersecurity? 
how do you coordinate what they're doing so that, that you maintain reliability when they're doing something that inherently affects that. So all that structural change turns out to be really important on, on multiple planes. Next slide, please. So how do we define modernization? You know, when I used to do smart grid stuff in my in previous jobs, I used to travel around the world and visit lots of utilities and ask them, what's your definition of smart grid? I have a whole basket full of definitions. It's great. Um, but the reason I did that was because every utility would give me their definition. It would always be focused on what's important to them. Um, and by the way, I, I went to East China Grid and I said, what's your definition of smart grid? They said, it's whatever state grid tells us it is. <laughs> <laughs> that was informative in itself. Now we're seeing, you know, in the modernized grid, we see all the illity words, right? Flexibility, affordability, all that kind of stuff. I have a list of about 80 of those illity words. So if you want some illity words, give me a call. I'll just, you know. Um, and this is an example that DOE did in 2015. The EPSA people did this. Um, but it gets to an interesting point. How do you define what you want the grid to be? That's a kind of a key issue for architecture, starting with what are the objectives that you want to have? Can you figure out what your architecture should be instead of saying, I've got some windows to hang. Next slide, please. So the way we think about this is it starts from the objectives. That really goes back to what's the purpose of the grid, if it's to serve the consumers and so on, what's driving that, what are the essential issues, the emerging trends and systemic issues. We use that to define, so what do we want the grid to be from the outside? How does it look for the users? That's what we call the system qualities. Then crossing over that dash line, we start to think about, so what properties does the grid have to have to be able to supply those qualities to the users? From that, then, we want to get to the architecture. What are the components and structures we need to do that? And we'd like to be able to do that in a relatively rigorous way so we can defend that and show in an open way why we got the architecture we did. So one of the things that we're working on is transforming architecture from being less of an art to more of a science. And that requires being able to quantify why the architecture supports the kinds of things that you're asking for it to do. Next slide, please. So where do you start with all this stuff? Well, you start with the objectives. You start with what is it you want this to do. Um, understand the forces involved. Some things are happening to change the grid all by itself without even a lot of planning. Um, then treat that in terms of, so what are the qualities you want it to have? What does that imply for properties? What does that imply for architecture? Uh, and that eventually reaches to the level of designs. Um, understand the legacy constraints. What is it about the structure we have today that's going to make it difficult to do what you need to do going forward? And what's the minimal change we have to make to relieve that constraint so it's easier to do the things you want to do? Get the structures right, and the downstream decisions become a lot easier. Um, we use this also to identify not just what the structural changes should be, should be but the platforms and to inform the interfaces as well. Those are all things that we can do with the architecture. Um, and as a last point, I'll say, remember, don't hang the windows first. Thank you. Hello again. Thanks for hanging in there with us to the bitter end. It's a long day, but I can't believe the uh, group of people that Paul brought together for this for today. What a great job. Thanks. I learned so much today and I, this is going to be a great resource for the whole industry when we post this and, and share it with the industry. Just the, the information shared today between, I don't know if you realize it, but the, the vendors and the experts that you heard from today are at the leading edge of what's going on in the whole industry. Hawaii, North America, period. It's, it's the it's the, uh, you know, the, the innovations and the new technologies and the interoperability efforts that, that are going on. We, we heard it today. And I'm just going to pile on Jeff's comments with some thoughts about uh, the architecture and, and interoperability. I'll just throw that word out there as, as, as we talk about this. And uh, just to start that, you know, it, the, interoper the concept of interoperability is so amazing. I just got a, my Fitbit, you know, I just got a little emoji text message from my son with a little penguin on it. Very exciting. And that came from my phone that has a Fitbit app on it that sent my, my text message over to my watch. And just so everyone knows, that means that the Penguins just beat the Capitals in Game 7. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all because of interoperability. <laughs> And Jeff's going to be very happy about that. He's from Pittsburgh. I lived in Pittsburgh for 10 years. My kids are Penguin fanatics, so it's very exciting. So 
So interoperability is very important, and that's the kind of thing we're going to be able to do with distributed resources when we get interoperability going. And so next slide. And I, this is just piling on, Jeff, that, you know, the thinking about the architecture is critical. You know, we, we do it kind of working from use cases on down and requirements and, and then thinking about the, the fundamental aspects of the infrastructure, communications, information, interoperability that's going to be needed to support those applications. Um, the architecture is what allows innovation, allows plugging in new technologies and, uh, and that the kind of things we're talking about today and cybersecurity on top of the whole thing. Next slide. Some things that we uh, think about in terms of challenges when we're working on that architecture, I think uh, the enterprise level integration, you know, it's clear, big data, data analytics, optimization, Watson, these things happen at the enterprise level. You're integrating with databases that are outside of the utility industry. Enterprise level integration is, is absolutely critical. So we're going to be thinking about that as part of the picture. At the same time as we're talking about open application platform and enabling devices to have intelligence and do smart things locally, getting data back to the enterprise is going to be a, a critical part of this, this whole interoperability picture. There's so much to be done with bringing data together from multiple smart devices to uh, do intelligent things. The communication infrastructure, we heard had a whole panel about, about having a communication infrastructure that really enables the technologies to plug in and, and both uh, on the distribution system as well as uh, working down to the customer. was delighted to hear presentation on open application platform. ITRON's thoughts on that, it's to be commended. We've been um, making a big deal about that at EPRI for, for a few years now. The opportunity for innovation by creating the platform for people to write applications for these devices to, you know, just unleash the innovation to take advantage of the meter or, you know, a whole slew of smart devices on the distribution system or in, in, in the customer's facility, and I'll mention one in just a minute. And then plugging cybersecurity on, on top of that. So these are, are challenges that, that still are on top of us, but at least we're, you know, we're thinking about them in terms of how we're going to solve them. So next slide. I want to go back to a slide I showed earlier from the smart grid trials in Australia, just to emphasize kind of this three-level concept to the architecture. Of, and this common platform aspect of the architecture is one of the most difficult ones to deal with for utilities because it doesn't fit the way we do rate cases, where we like to invest in something and we do a cost benefit on that thing and it all works out, so the regulator approves it, and it works out great. Everything in that bottom layer doesn't work that way. The whole communication infrastructure that has to support, support lots of applications, some of which we might not actually implement for two years, but we need to spend the money on the communication system now. It's a tough sell. But that's what the architecture helps us define that platform requirement in order to support the applications that we're going to need in two years when we have a lot more devices out there to connect and we need to be able to take advantage of flexibility and customers to support the grid requirements for high penetration of PV. So these common platform elements are absolutely critical. Then the next level is also an issue. Just the sensors and the deep visualization and control of the devices as we, as we grow that infrastructure also is a supporting infrastructure, but it's kind of at the next level, the, the, the devices that enable us to see what's going on and actually control the grid in real time, but it's one that we can expand as the applications grow. So it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more linked to the applications themselves. And then finally, the applications can take advantage of those sensors and, those, and that SCADA, those control capabilities to do smart things. Now we can actually do voltage optimization because we have the sensors out there to know what's going on and we have control of some devices and we have some devices that are doing local control and we can tie those all together and 
make the voltage optimization application work. We can do fault location and we can do system reconfiguration, but we got to lay the, plat the uh, foundational elements before those systems really work. We can spend money and design a fault location and reconfiguration system and it'll work great, but it won't support voltage optimization because we didn't think about the requirements that are common between those different applications. So good lessons from, from Australia on, on the kind of the different levels of the, the architecture that needs to be taken into account. Next slide. Kind of a fundamental question as we, as we, and I think it really applies here in, here in Hawaii, it applies in, in California, Eric, Eric talked about it. I think uh, we're gonna learn about how to do this in California and Hawaii and first, I talk about Ireland sometimes, but most of their renewables are on the transmission grid, so it's not as critical, but their, their distributed resources are the flexibility resources to integrate wind. So they have some of the same things going on. It's where do we put the control system for all these distribution resources, all these distributed resources. And it can go at a lot of different places. Could be a microgrid controller, that's a DERMS. Could be substation based to control the distributed resources on that distribution system. It could be an aggregator, aggregating devices from the cloud. Nest is a DERMS. Controlling Nest thermostats is just a form of DERMS. So there's, there's lots of different ways and actually our architecture has to support all of them because the, the DERMS is gonna work at all those different levels. Gonna have a home energy management system is essentially a DERMS. A microgrid controller is a DERMS. They, and all of those have to link together probably at the enterprise level that in terms of coordinating all of those distributed resources, the ones that are controlled locally, the ones that are controlled by an aggregator to get the most benefit of those, those resources out of the system. So this is gonna be a challenge to work on the interoperability at the local level and at the enterprise level to uh, build applications to integrate these distributed resources. So throw that out there as a special challenge and we look forward to, to working on that in, in uh, some of these places where high penetration is real and we have to make it work now. So that's a very high priority here in Hawaii. Next slide. And linked to that is the customer. You know, the making, I mentioned it before, and I'd like to emphasize it again, and this is the open application platform that I was gonna mention. This EMCB is the Energy Management Circuit Breaker. I throw it in there just as an example of the IoT type of technology that, that we need to think about how we're going to integrate. Energy Management Circuit Breaker is a breaker that goes in your panel that has revenue grade metering, has control capability, it has an open application platform so we can write applications to run on that breaker. So we could do equipment diagnostics, say it's on your air conditioning compressor. You can be, it's a power quality monitor. The one on my house, I get disturbance waveforms, voltage sag waveforms. I see the response of that motor to those voltage sags. I know if that motor's stalled, big problem in a lot of places. It's right in the breaker. I can see that my motor is one that's stalling on a voltage sag that goes below 60%. So, and it's Wi-Fi connected to the cloud. So it's, um, it's a powerful device, very accurate voltage monitoring, very fast capability to see that voltage. I could build a whole voltage optimization op application around energy management circuit breakers in selected customers on a distribution system. I don't need anything on the distribution circuit. I could do it all on customers' panels, bypass the meter and everything. Someone else could do it and make it work and sell it to you as a service, as a utility. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things to think about technologies that we're going to be able to take advantage of. Someone will take advantage, guaranteed. Eaton starts selling this breaker at Home Depot. Someone's gonna offer a maintenance program for devices in your home, your electric vehicle charger. This breaker is an electric vehicle charging circuit. It just got approved by UL two days ago for uh, using this breaker as a, as had with the, the uh, protection requirements of a electric vehicle charging circuit and the control wire that goes to and everything else comes right out of the breaker. So, you know, this is, these are applications that, that we're gonna be able to take advantage of and it could apply to, as an interface to many different devices in the house or that, that intelligence could go right down to the device. 
not even be in the breaker, maybe in the washing machine. So that is, those are distributed resources. Those are part of the grid. You know, so we have to, we heard a number of times today that the grid doesn't stop at the meter. It absolutely doesn't stop at the meter. The meter is a, a part of the architecture. Maybe in some cases the meter will just be a smart cash register. Other cases the meter might be the gateway. It's, those architectures are all completely legitimate to make things work, but we got to understand where the technology is and, and all, the, all the potential as we go forward. So I'll just throw those out as thought items as we, as we think about this. Slide. I think that's, uh, yeah, I just want to throw one slide up, it's a complicated one, just to think about testing the interoperability of all these devices. And, and uh, it's complicated for a reason because building a test platform to try out the things that will plug into these different elements of this architecture and all the different standards that can be applied is complicated. Jeff's company is building an application called GridAppD. I'm very excited about that. So that's a, that's a platform we'll be able to try out the actual functions like voltage optimization that would plug into a combination of a DMS and a DERMS and, and try it out on a simulation platform, including the interoperability issues, how the communication system plays in that. So watch for capabilities like that at NREL and at PNNL, and we're working on capabilities to do this kind of interoperability testing at EPRI as well. Eric's doubling the size of his lab where they do this kind of interoperability testing as well. But this is key to evaluating devices plugging in the architecture is to have the capability to, to verify why Sun compliance and we can, that we, or we can, when we download control functions to devices that it's really happening the way it's supposed to and 61850 standards in the future. So that's, um, these are some of the challenges that we face, but it's, you know, it's just a very exciting time with, with uh, all of the developments going on at the same time and the ability to actually take advantage of them. Thank you very much for the opportunity and look forward to any questions right now or final discussion. Any questions? Mind sharing? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. I actually had to clear this comment with Colton first. So uh, <laughs> First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Colton and Hiko and everybody who helped put this together. I mean, this has, to me, been a fantastic day for me for learning about what's going on. So I really appreciate that. And uh, But I now get first a comment and then uh, going back a question. For the comment is that, that it was alluded to over the course of today, but obviously not too many people talked about cost. But one of the other things people talked about was the softers, they put it, societal issues. And um, I don't think you can be dismissive of those things because the customers live in the society, they think differently. The utility has to live in not only a regulatory society, but a political and cultural society that is going to impact how they do things. So what, I'm from North Carolina originally. So what goes on in North Carolina or Illinois or California or Hawaii is going to be different because of those societal things. And so to be dismissive of that, of those, of those points is you, you do so at your own peril. So that's a comment, although you can kind of talk about that if you want. The, the question is, is that we waited until now, at least from what I saw, to really get into what Jeff and Mark were talking about in terms of cybersecurity. And I know I've been at Jeff's lab not too long ago, and we talked about the difficulty of shoehorning uh, cybersecurity technologies in after the fact and how difficult that's going to be. And, you know, and Mark alluded to crosswalking some of these issues to make things work correctly. So uh, you can talk about my first comment if you'd like, but my question is, uh, any more words that you all would like to say about cyber and how, how the technologies that you're developing, even if they're after the fact technologies? 
So with regard to the first issue, um, I didn't dwell on it, but in the model that I showed you that started with, um, you know, the consumer's interests and the objectives and leads to a set of system qualities and then system properties, uh, it's at the system quality level that we think about uh, those issues that you talked about and, and the public good and so on. And one of the things that we've been working on is how to actually be able to quantify the way that the architecture impacts those. Uh, and we expect that, that exactly as you said, in different parts of the country, in different parts of the industry, those will be weighted differently. And so consequently, the way that we have, uh, think about the architecture has to be able to uh, account for that weighting and figure out whether the architecture that's proposed does a better or worse job of, of fulfilling those weighted expectations versus some other architecture. That's part of the architectural evaluation stuff. With regard to cybersecurity, uh, you know, this is an issue that I have dealt with for years and years in my various positions, like I can't hold the job, IBM, Accenture, Cisco, and here. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of, of things that are essentially sort of pasting that stuff on top of everything else and uh, everybody pretty much says well that's a bad way to go but the real question is so how do you fix that and one of the things that we're doing with the architecture work is to say we're thinking about that in terms of secure secured and securable structures so before we even get down to the issue of I've got this system and that system they're talking to each other I want to examine is this particular arrangement for say a control architecture harder or easier to secure than another option and what does that mean in terms of how we would do it so that we start building it in at the architectural level as opposed to wait until we get to the design level and say how no we're going to put these pieces in here and there it's not a simple thing to do uh, as you know, uh, and we, when I was at Cisco, I learned probably 30 different kinds of things that you would do to secure networks. That's a lot of different stuff to sort out, so you have to have a structured approach to how to apply that stuff, and that's what we're working into the architectures that we're building as part of the, the DOE program, uh, but it's, it's still a pretty large effort, and we're expanding the problem because, keep hearing that phrase IoT all day today, right? So now we're having a whole bunch of things that, that are connected to the grid, and one of the rules in the networking world is connectivity introduces potential vulnerabilities. Well, think about this. We have a dual mode connectivity issue now because there's communication connectivity, but in our case there's also this electrical connectivity, and they don't always go in the same direction. So the communications may go off in a different direction, off to an aggregator, off to the cloud, whereas the electrical connectivity always goes to the, to the utility. So you know, how we just create a whole bunch of back doors over there for the bad guys to get into if we have these devices that have this ubiquitous communications capability that our networking friends have been so proficient at creating for us. That's opening up a big can of worms, frankly, in terms of what's possible. And if you remember, oh, what, a month and a half or so ago, we saw a whole bunch of IoT devices get shanghai and turned into an army. And what did they do? They didn't attack the websites. They attacked a web service, the DNS service, so that you couldn't get to the websites. So because of the way we do communications, we have these other kinds of problems where you can do inter indirect attacks too. So one of the problems we're starting to think about is so how do you protect the grid against those indirect attacks where the communications never flows through the utility at all and you can't use the traditional methods? Some open questions. Well, I think I wanted to mention two things related to the cybersecurity question that come to my mind. One is standards are important and being able to take advantage of technologies that are out there, encryption, VPN, whatever, to, to help with cybersecurity is one important aspect. But I think another aspect is a side benefit of what we call deep situational awareness. As we have more sensors and we build model-based system management, utilities are working on concepts like ISOCs, Integrated Security Operations Centers. That concept applies very well to distribution systems as well and when we get to knowing how things are supposed to work and our models are good we have much more ability to identify when something's not exactly right and even pinpoint where that is the, so the more granular our data is and the more we're aware of what what's going on and we can compare that to well, the more we're going to be able to identify security breaches quickly and isolate them and I think the, it's a very important side benefit of the sensors and the system awareness that, that uh, we talk about for many of the applications. Cybersecurity becomes another application for that deep situational awareness.
questions? Well, let me thank the uh, let's, let's thank the panel. <laughs>
that's it. That's all I wanted to, to say. Um, for all of the panelists and the moderators uh, who are still here, I know some folks had to leave, I just want to ask you to stick around for another five minutes afterwards. We want to take a photo uh, of all of you um, as a team, and uh, we'll share that out with you. So please stick around.